Our first speaker for this webinar is Mr. Robert Ewell. Robert Ewell is the founder and executive director of Key Risk Consulting Asia. He is a highly qualified and experienced corporate sector risk and investigations expert with over 35 years of senior level experience in investigations and risk consulting. He has extensive expertise in corporate risk strategies including the development and management of anti-bribery programs, the investigation of complex fraud, embezzlement, corruption and other serious criminal activity within the private sector. During his career Robert has worked with many of the world's best-known Fortune 100 companies in numerous countries both within and outside Asia. Our second speaker for this webinar is Mr. Zafar Anjum. Zafar Anjum is the founder and group CEO for Corporate Research and Investigations and Abbott's Center of Excellence. Zafar has built 30 years career in anti-corruption, compliance, risk management, fraud prevention, protective integrity, security and compliance. He was recently awarded the Exceptional Expert in White Collar Crime Investigations by Financia Worldwide. As a trusted authority in anti-bribery and anti-corruption, fraud risk assessment and prevention, corporate compliance evaluation, securities among corporate clients, government agencies and industry groups, he is known for creating stable and secure networks across challenging global markets. Zafar is often the first certified global investigator on the scene when multinational EMEA corporations seek to close compliance, anti-bribery and anti-corruption or corporate security gaps. Let me start with the first question to you. I've been working for almost 30 years in many, many companies, multinational companies. I know some employees, they are using runners, middlemen, uh, agents to make personal dealings. What the Chinese always say here in Malaysia, Kao Tim with authorities, the gatekeepers, to get illegal things done. Now that we have the Section 17A in place, mm. well, this middleman, well, the company can no longer say that uh, they, they do not know about it, okay? Because even though this middleman is not under their payroll risk, but still company can be held accountable for, stealing for, for such practice. So as company, what they can and must do internally when bribery practice is discovered within the first 40 hours of discovery. Over to you, Robert. Thank That's, you. That was a good question, Sam, and, th and thanks very much. The, the situation you described there was really a kind of a facilitation payment and small bribe payments, which, to be quite frank, many, many companies just ignore. Um, as far as Section 17 is concerned, It's really the, the accumulation of those activities over a period of time that makes it into an actual larger issue. But the, this morning's presentation really is, is not just about dealing with small bribes and facilitation payments. It's really to try and teach companies or give the companies the uh, direction that they can take in relation to what to do when bribery and corruption has been discovered within the first 48 hours. Of, of discovery and what should come out of this everybody is 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 kind of a self-help kit that you can put to put to use straight away uh, following my presentation 
but then with a presentation about the systems uh, that you you should be putting in place to address things such as the Section 17A that you've just mentioned and other bribes and corruption activity that I'll be talking about in the first 30 to 40 minutes. So basically what we're looking at here is, is as per the title, we're looking at bribery and corruption the first 48 hours after discovery. Now, a number of years ago, some of you are on this, are on this webinar actually know me personally. Um, I was a police officer for 20 years investigating organized crime. And basically the, the rule was if within 48 hours you didn't know or didn't have an idea of, of what had actually occurred, you had actually no chance of ever solving the crime. So that's where that title kind of comes from. So if you're in corporate and you have a whistleblower that talks, that gives you information of a potential act of corruption within your business and you do nothing for a week, two weeks or whatever, and we have seen it, then you've, you're basically diminishing significantly the possibilities of you ever finding out what actually happened. So hopefully after this session, you will have some tools in the toolbox that will actually help you do that. So let's kick off. Starting out with the damage that corruption and bribery causes to the global business community. And there you see a figure of 2.9 billion. Well, to be quite frank, I, I think that's an underestimation because that obviously that sum comes from known cases, known incidents. But of course, what about all those incidents that to this day have been gone unnoticed? So I would say that 2.9 billion is something of a very conservative number. But what it does say is that this is not some small bribe kickback situation that's just a nuisance. It's a big global issue that needs addressing. And I think probably everybody on this webinar this morning understands that. The key elements, and I put in fraud and corruption here because quite often companies, corporates get mixed up between whether a fraud has been committed or there's been an act of corruption committed within their organization. So just for this slide, we'll talk about those elements together. But fraud and corruption, basically, the elements of the offense tend to be very similar. That's why we often get the confusion. For example, there's some form of deception involved, um, whether that deception is fixing up the books, overwriting, changing orders, um, and so on and so on, passing a winning, you know, a potential winning bid to a, to a bidder to make sure he wins and he gets a kickback. There's a deception. There's definitely an act of dishonesty. I can't think of any situation where everyone's involved in bribery that does it for honest means. I'm not sure about the audience, but I think we'd all be struggling to figure out where corruption and bribery had an element of honesty within it. I don't think there's any element of that, quite frankly. Intent. You don't get involved in corruption accidentally. You do it with a purpose. You do it with what we call in the legal service with a, you know, with a, a definite decision to get involved in it, a mental state to get involved. It's not by accident. So there's always an intent. And the intent is usually to gain a loss. Now, usually we think of corruption as the fact that the individuals involved are doing it for financial gain or some form of gain. But we've, we've investigated cases in the past where there's been corruption um, engaged in between parties with the intent to, to actually damage the company's reputation, not just financial gain for the perpetrators, but to actually bring either a loss to the company they work for or to actually damage the reputation of the company they work for. Whenever we investigate corruption, the golden rule is always follow the money because at the end of the day, invariably, whilst I just talked about there's an, there could be an intent to cause loss to a company's reputation, there's invariably money involved. Yes, we have gifts, we have, we have entertainment provided as a form of corruption, but the vast majority majority of the time it involves money and if money is involved from an investigator's standpoint if you're going to start investigating an allegation a kickback allegation look at the money to start with where's the money coming from where's the money going to if at all so basically what i'm going to do now i'm going to look at several elements of, of bribery and corruption and why it occurs these three elements are vitally important to help you understand in the first 48 hours where to put your resources in terms of investigation <clears throat> so basically we have three elements there's the incentive, the opportunity, and the rationalization 
of the people involved in the activity, okay? So I'm gonna break these down. Incentive, these are some of the issues we get. Personal financial obligations. A lot of these offenses are, are, are committed by managers, senior managers, or even owners of the company. Perceived or real adverse effects on reporting poor financial results. Personal financial situation is threatened by the entity's financial performance, okay? These are these tend to be at the upper end of, of the issues of fraud and corruption when it's more senior management oriented versus the, the introduction we had from Sumi who was talking about uh, facilitation payments and, and soft level payments and small payments at the, at the gate of the factory to allow trucks in, things of that nature. Here we're talking serious senior level management kind of corrupt activity. Recurring negative cash flows while reporting a profit. Um, <laughs> the history has shown us many of these companies where this has actually happened. Um, all kinds of corruption schemes going on whereby companies have, have inflated the amount of money they have in the bank or their financial positions when they don't in fact have that position. And then there's a good old element of course is greed. Greed, and there it is, and everyone knows what that means, but this is an important element as to one of the incentives of why individuals get involved with bribery and corruption. Next bit, opportunity. Now this is a key important point for folks here on, on the call today, because the second half of the presentation this morning will be about, or will concern itself with a, a significant portion of the opportunities that can be plugged that can be stopped if you have an anti-bribery management system in place before an act of bribery takes place. But as far as opportunity is concerned, we looked at ineffective monitoring of and or by management. In other words, no management oversight of what is occurring within the company. All the focus is on is profit, a set susceptible to diversion. Ineffective monitoring of by management, as I mentioned that earlier before, I think we, we had to change the slide process. Assets of the company or the business being susceptible to diversion the financials of the business being based on estimates that involve judgment or uncertainties and thus difficult to corroborate and monitor. And again, second part of the, the session, when we talk about having a proper anti-bribery management system in place, it will address this kind of issue, but this doesn't occur. The company's got a business which has highly complex transactions, especially closing periods, quarters, end of year, mid-year, whatever. This is when corruption really can creep in very quickly and easily because focus tends to be on what is occurring at the financials at the end of the year. And this, of course, is a very important one. Ineffective accounting information and control systems. Again, second part of this morning's session, you're going to be learning about the anti-bribery management processes and systems, which can actually tackle this particular issue. And of course, hopefully shut this down as being a way of the, of, of, of the uh, corrupt individuals having an opportunity to make use of the system. Next one is rationalization. This one really comes from the reason why people do it. Rationalization is a very important element in the investigation and detection of corruption. And these are some of the ones we've come across in our work over the years. The suspect has said, basically says, everyone else was doing it, so why shouldn't I? Um, and if, if you were involved in the pharmaceutical industry in China a number, quite a number of years ago, I think it's safe to say that everyone was doing it because it was just part of the culture of the way that industry operated. Some individuals have sat in front of us and said, I didn't even know it was a criminal activity to do that to the company. The company's got tons of money. Why is it a problem? It doesn't seem to be a criminal activity to me. Again, they're rationalizing this out in their own head. Couple more. I felt used and wanted revenge. This one normally occurs where people have been looked over for promotion or bonuses and they say they're in sales or procurement and they see an opportunity to make some money because they didn't receive what they thought was their due uh, from the company and wanted to get revenge. I meant no harm and did no harm. Very similar to it's not criminal activity. But some people believe that if they're involved in corruption and it doesn't affect the, the bottom line of the company as much as they believe, then they've done no harm. The guy, they, they, they talk about the uh, truck drivers that are paying money to the to the, uh, the forklift driver in the company yard to over unload trucks first, probably feels there's no harm being done whatsoever. But you accumulate that one and two, three, four dollars each time a truck's unloaded and pays to be unloaded quicker over 12 months, this becomes becomes a significant sum. In their mind, they think there's no harm. Usually this is management. It's very senior management. I did it to keep the business afloat. Again, very similar to everyone else was doing it. Bribery is the norm in this type of business. And unfortunately, in a number of countries within Asia, uh, that is definitely true. There's certain industries where bribery is just the norm and people move from one company to another in the same industry and they take with them that attitude. What I did was entirely appropriate for someone in my position. I'm not really sure how you can actually rationalize that one, but we have heard it before. And finally, the usual, my employer didn't compensate me enough, so therefore I took what I thought was mine. And this is a very common one where, again, very similar to the person over passed over for promotion or bonus or pay rise, and they think they should be compensated adequately. So they get 
get involved in bribery and corruption. So these these are the three elements that we need to consider when you start to look at investigating bribery in the first 48 hours. Who are the key players? Well, basically, you know, the, the more complex the corrupt activity, invariably the more senior management are involved. Um, so it's not something that occurs, as I say, with the forklift truck driver unloading trucks at the gate, it goes all the way to the top. And normally when it reaches, when it reaches the top, it's normally obviously senior management. And we've all seen uh, the media articles over the years on that. Bribery and corruption perpetrated by outsiders, people outside the company, basically they're just, they're scams galore. But what we found within, within this region is that really business related corruption activity most often involves some level of collusion between your staff, the company staff, our client staff, and external third party vendors. And again, this is where such such elements as due diligence on your third party vendors is such a crucial piece of work to do if you want to stop corruption, getting a foothold in the company, especially if you have large numbers of third party vendors to your business. There are many ways in corruption is discovered. Customers complain about errors in statements. It's discovered accidentally. A supposed customer, supplier, or employer is found to be phantom when the books are being checked. Rewriting or overwriting financial records or procurement records and so on. This isn't a common one following the departure of a certain employee or a group of employees and uh, people start looking at the, the work that was done and trying to take over the work that was done by this team and lo and behold we find there's been irregularities in what's been going on which invariably leads to an issue relating to corruption not uncommon at all routine internal audits many companies run their own audits not just external but internal audits for different departments um, and often th this is one of the ways in, in which corruption is identified but basically everyone on the court ladies and gentlemen in our in our experience the number one way in which corruption is is discovered within a corporation is due to a whistleblower anonymous letter a complaint or something of that nature this is, is i would say more than 70 percent of the cases that come for investigation will come as a result of whistleblower or anonymous letter and one of the things we should be hearing about today is of course the importance of having within your corporation the capability for employees customers or third-party agents to anonymously if necessary but in total confidentiality make complaints or pass on information in respect of corruption that could be taking place within your organization if that facility is not available and quite often we hear we don't have any complaints no one's ever complained to us the reason because you don't have an ability for them to make that complaint so if you have that ability or that capability then usually this is where most of the corruption allegations will come from okay we've evolved around corruption what it is how complex it can be what the elements etc so what you want to do now part of the tools in the toolbox what to do when corruption is discovered within your organization what makes the investigation of corruption different basically you have invariably two happy parties to the activity and where you have two happy parties it's very difficult to investigate and break them up what normally happens is you have a whistleblower who was party to that corrupt activity who's not getting the share that he thought he should get or he's been kicked out of the group or whatever that's how it normally happens but the difficulty of investigating corruption is that you invariably have two happy elements it's trying to get break through those two unhappy elements to get to the truth of what's been going on that is the complicated section of this 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 whole thing again due, due to the fact that businesses operate not just in one town one city one country the geographical spread make the investigation of corruption because of various jurisdictions that you operate in somewhat complex so one of the things you will need to do is where you have joint offices joint operations in different countries you should have someone that's possible legal or hr look at the legal issues relating to private investigation work in those countries because if you're going to go ahead and look internally to do some work to find out whether that element that, that whistleblower allegation is correct and say jakarta or in nairobi or whatever it may be a part of your operations then you should really know what what jurisdiction you're operating in or what that jurisdiction says you can and cannot do this is quite an important element that people tend to forget and of course, the other issue is, as we'll look through this in a few more minutes, is the funding. I said at the beginning, go after the money. Remember that picture with the lady with the RMB in her hands? Very important element because of the, the ability today to move money electronically. Then it's vital that you move very quickly to find out what funds have been taken, what funds have leaked, and if possible at all, where they've gone. Okay, internal planning. Basically, internal planning for an act of corruption starts at the top. The tone is from the top downwards as to what will take place 
should an element of corruption be discovered within the organization. And invariably, that decision is driven by the, the corporate management, the corporate culture, corporate policy, if there is one. And of course, sometimes it will be as a result of regulators, as, as you would be with FCPA, for example, if that governed your operations. Um, what, they, what the regulators require you to do when fraud and corruption, or sorry, corruption is discovered. Another element that will decide what's going to happen will be the information that's known to you at the time, that's known to see the management at the time, help that decision-making process. And of course, the potential amounts involved. Again, we talked about the forklift truck drivers and all that kind of thing. That's a small activity. It's not enterprise threatening and probably would be not considered the bigger threat to the business versus something where a large uh, contract has been lost. Millions and billions have been lost as a result of someone very high up within the contract department taking a kickback to allow that to happen. So again, it depends on the, the amounts involved that will dictate the speed and the internal planning. Of course, and I've just alluded to this, that the positions of those that are allegedly involved in the activity will very much dictate what actually happens and what, what senior management's sort of concerns will be from the get-go once the, the event has been discovered. Locations involved, again, I mentioned this earlier, know the jurisdictions in which you will have to operate, not just from a business context, but from the fact you would have to conduct internal investigation what can you do in terms of labor issues some countries have much more strict labor laws than others you need to know that in case a suspect arises very quickly in the investigation and you have to deal with that individual you should know straight off what jurisdiction will govern the, the labor laws that you're that, that person is operating in one of the most important elements of this of course is whether the investigation is undertaken discreetly or not um i will deal with this in detail in a few more minutes. Of course, the other element, of course, is what resources have you got to enable you to do an investigation? Not every company has the benefits of having the resources to deal with this kind of issue. Again, that will weigh on, on, on the mindset of senior management. Corporate management, again, we're still focusing at the corporate tone from the top level. Concerns when corruption is discovered. Obviously, one of the most important elements will be how much. What losses is this causing to the business? Again, when we talked about the elements of the offense, loss or gain, then this would be where the element of loss would come in. How much have we lost as a result of losing that contract to an act of corruption? What are the losses or the impact likely to be? Who's involved? How deep does it go? Accountability. Again, if it's something that's an enterprise threatening activity, then it's likely to involve some form of management level activity. This needs to be known at a very early stage before you start the investigation proper. Remember the fraud triangle? So that the, the, the triangle for fraud and corruption, sorry. How was the act committed, the modus operandi? How did they get away with it? In other words, start reviewing your systems immediately and find out where the loopholes are that allow them to get away with it. Remember, the opportunity is the thing you need to focus on. You're following the money. Where was the opportunity that allowed that money to go out the door or the act of corruption to take place? Can we otherwise recover losses? Again, if you've lost a contract, is there any way that you can get to get together and form some form of, of legal, legal approach to this that saves the day in some way? In other words, how can we recover losses when the issues are discovered? How to keep it under wraps? Because one of the issues, of course, is the reputational damage that these things can cause to an organization. So decisions from the top will relate to how do we keep this thing under wraps until we can assess how bad the damage is? Um, word of caution, of course, here, don't leave it too long. Because if you leave it too long and you're, you're subject to, say, FCPA or whatever, then the longer you leave it, the longer it can be seen as a cover-up. Okay, so that's got to be a fine balance there about how long you keep this under wraps until you assess the damage and the reputation of the organization. Of course, an issue, this will be more than likely for legal is there a requirement under the under under our company activity to report this issue to the regulators? And if so, how much time have you got before that report must be made? Again, that goes towards the elements above. How long do you keep it under wraps? Another issue, should we make a report to law enforcement? We've done cases in the very recent past where companies have, have discovered kickbacks being undertaken by a manager, say for example, and the knee-jerk reaction of the CEO was to go straight to his buddy at the local police station and make a report to police. So the police come down, all in their uniforms and police cars outside. 
start wandering around the offices. Everybody knows an issue has occurred. The perpetrators involved in that particular uh, corrupt activity resigned forthwith and left the building. Um, these are serious considerations. In some cases, you will have to make a report to law enforcement depending upon the circumstances. If someone's emptying the company bank accounts, for example, because of what it, an activity going on, then probably law enforcement are the ones you want to go to to stop that. But again, this is all down to the jurisdictions in which you operate. How trustworthy, of course, are the law enforcement officials in which you're going to make the report to? That's a decision that is, in this part of the world, is a very big one. So basically, each of these issues, these concerns, will undoubtedly have some level of impact, impact on how the investigation is planned and executed. So that's the concern from the top. All right, let's look at the first 48 hours, which is what we're all talking about here today. And basically what we're looking at, until such time something like fraud or corruption is confirmed versus merely alleged, then we have to consider a number of approaches. And we would always come down on the side of discrete. Now, the reason for this is several fold, but bear in mind we sit at the top here. Until the allegation is confirmed. Very often, as I mentioned earlier, we get whistleblowers who are the main source of information regarding the acts of corruption within our business. That allegation could be completely malicious, can be given against a manager who overlooked or not overlooked, who didn't promote somebody in his department for very good reasons, who, who put someone on a disciplinary record. It's very easy to make the allegations. It's very difficult to prove and disprove. So until you are sure this event took place, then we would advocate more than anything else that this should be done in-house discreetly. A number of reasons, because it buys you time. We talked earlier about how long you leave it before you have to report to the regulators or whatever, how long you keep it under wraps. Remember, when, when one of these incidents occurs and there seems to have credibility to it, then the speed of activity is important. And I'm going to talk about the people you can bring in to speed up the way in which you can actually deal with this problem. But dealing with it discreetly buys you that time. At that time, of course, is what you need to be focusing on is refuting the allegations, again, which may be untrue or malicious. Is it possible there's some credence to this allegation? And if there is, what are we going to do about it? Or is it merely an allegation which is not just anonymous, and you will get those, anonymous with no facts to it, the timing of what's being said doesn't make sense, the person involved is not identified, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All those together will, buy, will, be, will need time to go through before you start to move into action. And if you have got a suspect, then buying time and conducting yourself discreetly allows you to, to do the investigation that doesn't, so the, the suspect is not alerted or alienated. We've been in cases where we've had an allegation made, the, the senior manager have decided the best way to deal with this is to put the gentleman concerned on gardening leave. Well, the minute he goes on gardening leave, A, if he hadn't done it, he's going to be very upset with the company. B, if he has done it, he's probably going to put his resignation in or start talking to people on the phone or on WhatsApp and telling him to hide the evidence. So this discreet is a way of being able to work on the suspect if you have one very quickly uh, in a much better efficient manner. It also allows discrete access to evidence, evidential material. If there's allegations which could be traced back through accounting records, for example, then you can pull the accounting records and, have, and, and check them with a, a, a suitable storyline as to why you need to do that. Again, it buys you that time. And of course, an important point when we're talking about loss and loss of reputation is, of course, conducting discreetly it keeps media at bay for quite a time, which is all that important. However, having said that, and I'm sure you, you, you the audience, can think of other reasons why you should, you should also do this discreetly. Um, but where it's not appropriate, of course, where the suspects, as we, as we just said, have run off, resigned, disappeared, not come into work or whatever, then that changes the whole ballgame in terms of doing it discreetly. If the actual act of corruption or bribery turns out to be an absolute life threatening or an enterprise threatening, should I say, event, then it's all hands on deck and discreet it goes out the window because you're trying to save the corporation or the company or the enterprise. Another one would be where access to potential evidential material 
cannot be secured discreetly. Uh, and this again would be where you're operating in different countries and uh, say legal counsel, the head office needs to recover documents from some another jurisdiction, then the manner in which you do that, it's going to be a little bit tricky to do that discreetly because of what you have to do. But these are, these are the elements that need to be considered in the first 48 hours. Okay, so planning resources is key. This whole thing will be coming to the last couple of three slides here and the elements that are going to lead into the next session. Planning and resource is the key to being able to tackle bribery and corruption adequately and safely within the first 48 hours. So what should be done here? If it's if bribery and corruption has been has been alleged and very quickly looks credence, there's credibility to this thing, then we've got to establish clear objectives and reporting timelines. Tone from the top is vital at this point. Who is going to take charge of the investigation? What are the objectives that we're trying to achieve here? And when are we going to report to me? I want to know what's going on. That type of situation. Allocation of tasks to those best equipped to deal with it. Again, we've seen we've seen cases where um, the CEO or the senior managing director has, has issued instructions straight away to to an individual. To, 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 a classic example: we were, we, were, we were in Penang several weeks ago, and uh, we found out when we were doing some interviews that the the poor lady in charge of HR was designated by the CEO to investigate corruption as it related to an arson that occurred in one of their warehouses. Well, I'm sorry, but Lady in HR, as nice as she is, as lovely a girl as she is, and an efficient HR girl as she is, didn't know very much about investigating arson or corruption. The tasks have to be allocated to those best equipped to deal with it. Don't just hand out a task. Ensure debriefings are done on a very regular basis. Bear in mind that this, what could look like a small allegation of corruption, can very quickly turn into be a monster. So it's very important you know when that monster is coming. So senior management should be giving direction as to when briefing and debrief leaks will take place during the investigation. Ensure clear reporting lines. I am in charge, you report directly to me. Not it's up to you who you tell. There must be very, this is the policeman coming at me again, you can see that, right? Ensure clear reporting lines are given right from the get-go. Focus on investigative activities which support agreed objectives. Case example, we were recently doing a, an investigation or in fact assisting um, a hotel chain with, with investigations and uh, an issue they had was that the, 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 the team that did the investigations would very frequently go off track. So if there was an allegation that a particular chef or whatever had a conflict of interest with the supplier, the investigation would commence and they would find out that the chef, the would-be chef, drives a, a Porsche and then they would start to focus on who got the Porsche, what the Porsche is worth, and going right off track as to what the allegation was. That was there was a conflict of interest. So it's very easy for that to happen. And it's very important that senior management or whoever's in charge of the investigation ensures that doesn't happen, which is why you have these constant and very clear debriefings. Okay, moving on swiftly. Planning and resources. One of the things we advocate every single time is before this occurs, this, this, this incident occurs, is to have in place your dream team. And this is basically individuals within the company who've got those skill sets to do certain parts of the investigation very quickly and very efficiently. And it stands to reason, for example, that they, this should encompass legal and procedural knowledge individuals for financial and business, computer forensics, and I'll talk a little more about that very shortly. Investigative skills, you may, you may, you know, you may not have your own investigations in the company, but you may have people that have had some form of background. For example, HR, I've often got people that have done internal investigations in the past, and that those individuals may be the best people to do the investigation component. Again, that would also be for the interviewing techniques, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, because interviewing is not just having a conversation, not in these scenarios. You want someone that's got strong analytical skills that can sit down, look at what's coming in, and make solid decisions about what needs to be done phase by phase. And really, probably the most important is this one, administrative skills. 
So often we see companies that have en engaged in internal investigation over an incident and have not administered one single piece of paper involved. They don't know where the evidence is. They don't know where the ledger's gone, who looked at it, who copied it, nothing. It's vitally important that someone is put in charge of administrating the actual investigation itself. As I said, these things can start out really small, you know, a few hundred, a few hundred US or something, or even smaller than that. But you never know where it's going to grow. And it's very important that you remember that and that the dream team is selected early on when that when that actually happens. So these are the people we say should be involved and should be set up before um, an incident occurs. Prioritizing the action. Now, these will depend, of course, on the circumstances of what's been discovered. The allegation has been made. It's been looked at very quickly and carefully, and there seems to be some credence to it. OK, so what we're looking at again, we will need to as I said, first confirm the allegations or at least establish there is some reason to believe it. That is your most important priority. OK, unless unless there's, I guess would, there would be an enterprise threatening activity and millions of dollars would be siphoned out of the bank account electronically, then yes, that's a priority. But an, an equal priority is to find out if none of that is taking place as the credence um, to the allegations being made, because you can do so much damage to morale when you start accusing people of things they've never done. Uh, and again, we've seen that happen. Secure potential documentary and electronic evidence. Um, as you know, we don't live in a completely paperless office at the moment. So documentary evidence and electronic evidence is very important. Stem further losses. Um, if you've discovered during the, the initial investigation that there's a loss being had somewhere, um, checks, cash accounts are going out, whatever it is, then stem further losses immediately. Interview potential witnesses. Um, vitally important. If allegations have been made, and there's, there's a potential witness to that allegation, and the potential witness, of course, would be the whistleblower. Do everything you can to get the whistleblower to give you further and better particulars of the incident. We very often find that the whistleblower is actually passing on information for someone else who's too afraid to come forward. Um, I mentioned earlier that you know corruption involves two happy people or two, several happy entities. When one of those entities goes sour, they turn they often turn to a whistleblower, but they will not pass the information themselves because they've been involved in the incident. They'll go to a third party. So we often say and we we often urge that interview potential witnesses and make one of them very early on in the game the whistleblower himself, if at all possible. They don't always want to come forward, but do your best to do that. Get all the facts you can as quickly as you can. And then, as I say, have that person that has those analytical skills, look over what you've got and come up with a hypothesis as to what happened. Remember that triangle and then what further investigation needs to be undertaken to achieve objectives. Interview suspects. Now, I put this here for a reason. I'll talk about this in a second. But one of the things we find very, very often occurs is senior management come across or are given access to an allegation that someone, a, a, a junior manager, say, has been involved in a conflict of interest issue. And of course, where there's corruption, there's always a conflict of interest. And uh, immediately instructs HR to bring in the person that's been made the allegation against and interview him. Wrong. We always advocate that if the person has been accused of something, do the investigation first before the interview. If you interview the individual first and he hasn't done anything wrong, he's going to be mightily miffed at the company. If he is involved, you've just basically blown the whole investigation. Um, We've seen it so many times because you know, when the CEO gets angry or the MD gets angry, he wants to talk this guy straight away. Uh, please, if you can, resist that temptation. And of course, you must have all this information. You're going to draw conclusions and present reports. Um, and I've mentioned about the ad administration of the investigation. You want someone that, that can actually put a good report together. We see so often a, a quite decently good investigation done quickly and efficiently inside a company. And the person that puts the report together does a terrible job and it leaves nothing but question marks that get passed around for weeks and months later. So 
if you've got someone that can actually write a good report, analytical mind, have them do that for you. And of course, learn from the event. Don't just treat it as a one-off, it could never happen again, as we've come across. Look at it and say, how on earth could we stop this happening again? And the next session, we'll actually be talking exactly about that and how to make sure that doesn't happen. I'll talk potential electronic evidence. I mentioned this, but I want to move on very quickly now. Um, most people think of electronic evidence as computers, but from our perspective, electronic evidence can come from a whole variety of places. Um, PABX systems, telephone records, fax machines, and so on. So don't just think computers. If you're trying to secure electronic evidence and you don't have someone on your team that is a, um, an expert on, on data forensics, then I would suggest do not have corporate IT or the local IT guy come in and see if you can find anything on the guy's or the lady's computer. Get the computer put to one side, lock it up safely, and get yourself a forensic um, data recovery guy that knows how to do this properly because you can make a terrible mess of this and you could lose a huge amount of evidence that could show you the damage that's been caused to your business. Don't be surprised in the kind of a, 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 um, situation you will find evidence, paper evidence. This is one case we did not several years ago in China where two of the staff spent the whole afternoon shredding all the fake invoices. We actually put these invoices back together. I'm not making it up, it's true. It took forever, but it was worth it. Um, so be cautious of what leaking the information out early so that they can have the opportunity to do this. Again, never be surprised where you will find the evidence. Um, in this case, it was in a managing director's office. He had a wardrobe in his office. When you open the wardrobe, there's the clothing, a couple of boxes. Behind that is a secret doorway that leads into a very small little cabinet there in which all the, the fake documents were, were kept. So do not be surprised what these individuals will do in order to hide the evidence of their corrupt activity. It happens. Intelligence, I, I mentioned about administering and tracking the investigation. This is an exaggeration because these are intelligence databases which most corporations will not subscribe to. Um, but if you can find some way that someone that's got the analytical mind that can track the investigation piece by piece, then always think of how, if, if you can do it, have them do it. You may have within your department, again, data, data crunching folks that know exactly how to do something like this. So it may be something that's very useful to you. So always find a way to track the investigation. Please don't leave it just out in the open. All right, I'm gonna finish off now. When I mentioned earlier um, about interviews, interview the witnesses, the suspects, etc. And we always said, use an interview the suspect or suspect late on in the investigation is always the preferred methodology. Um, if you're gonna do that, and I hope we do, then key to everything is preparation. We've so often seen people being interviewed who've been accused of an incident and there's some credence to it and there's some evidence to it and the, the individual that's going to do the interview has got no training, no preparation, but has been given a list of questions by legal and they just sit and go through the questions. They don't listen to the answers. They just have to go through the questions. So basically, whoever you designate to interview the individual that's suspected to be wrongdoing, get them trained up, have them exposed to how to do non-confrontational interviews and use non-confrontational approaches so that they can best serve you, the company, and better do the job they've been asked to do. Because you may have circumstantial evidence all over the place and the right questions to the suspect may elicit a confession. And we've had that happen. So don't waste the opportunity, if at all possible. And people lie a lot. Detecting untruth in the interviewer is a skill. Um, it's not something that you can just walk in and do yourself. Detecting lies and untruths is something that you need to be trained and exposed to, uh, to do properly. So finally, okay, start with a plan. Put a team together, have a plan of how you're gonna deal with, with, with the issues when they arise. And that will be, of course, having in place an anti-bribery management system. Keep to the plan until you find it needs adjusting. In other words, don't just don't come out with one hypothesis and to hell or high water, I'm gonna follow that hypothesis and I don't care where the evidence takes me. No, flexibility is important, but have a plan to start with. Very, very important. Seek to confirm or refute allegations as early as possible. 
do not jump out of the chair and go and interview the suspect or the person led straight away, find out if there's any credence to what's been given. Again, prevent further losses, secure potential evidence, as we've discussed, whether it's electronic, paper, and so on. And if, if, if at all, and you reach the point where you do have credence to the allegation, there is some, the evidence you've got tends to indicate that this individual or individuals were involved in this act of corruption and bribery activity, but you still need to buy yourself some time, then of course, if it's appropriate within the jurisdiction in which the labor laws allow, then consider putting the person on gardening leave. Remember, you've secured the evidence now, so it doesn't matter that they now know they're under investigation. And in certain countries like, for example, Malaysia, there's very strict rules and regulations of how you put someone on gardening leave and the processes that you have to go through. And if you do not go through those processes, then there's a very, very high chance that if this person goes to a labor tribunal, they will win. So again, learn what in the jurisdiction, not just what information you can gather as a private citizen, but learn the labor laws within that jurisdiction as well for things like gardening leave. And again, as mentioned towards the end, please resist the temptation to jump out the chair, grab, grab the person by the scruff of the neck and drag him into the root HR's office and interview him as a suspect because he's got, there's an allegation made against him. No unprepared interviews. It's a very crucial component of the whole investigation process. And finally, really, failing to plan is planning to fail. So if you don't have a plan that's going to deal with corruption when it occurs, and if you have, if some companies do, oh, it'll never happen here. We have a great system in place. Perfect. It'll never happen here. Wrong. Okay. Failing to plan is planning to fail. And one of the best ways you can do that is to put in place a robust anti-bribery management system that promotes trust and confidence amongst all the employees, third party vendors, stakeholders, and the community that you work in. And this is really, you can't build the dream team. You can't do this 48 hours, find out what on earth has gone on and stem losses, et cetera, et cetera, unless you have that plan in place to start with. And I believe that's where I will leave it. I hope you've enjoyed that. And I believe we're going to be taking questions at the end. But hope now, I think you're going to be um, listening to, 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 to a presentation concerning how to put in place an anti-bribery system so that what I've just explained to you can happen extremely efficiently. Thank you. subject of uh, webinar means uh, the first 48 hours. In my point of view, as a certification body, our uh, subject specific uh, expertise based on what we have as of now with different case studies are the certification process we conducted uh, with different clients. Uh, the most important factor is when you received any information or any uh, complaint or allegation, the first step should be to evaluate the level of complaints or allegations. As Mr. Robert uh, said that there is a possibility that some, maybe there is a personal vendetta or somebody is complaining baselessly. So be, the first thing is to evaluate the complaint or the allegation, to check the material provided along with uh, the information, or if that is just a verbal information or just a, a written complaint without any evidence. So internal process is involved. That's where we uh, always push to adequate procedures.
So what is the level of procedures you have for internal controls? And those internal controls mean um, uh, your investigation process in-house or uh, within the organization. The procedures you are adopting when you receive any incident or when you receive any kinds of wrongdoing. So what is the level of? The first is to evaluate the complaint, to evaluate, evaluate the evidence. And if you find it's a serious nature of complaint and you have initial level of beliefs, okay, then the other process is to engage the relevant departments. That can be internal audit team. That can be uh, HR people or any maybe a, a head of department, dep depending the level and nature of the incident. And uh, we can see the most, uh, in most case studies, the third party relationship is always a questionable. And uh, sometimes organizations is not directly involved with any bribery, giving or paying, but there is a possibility that your third party agents or partners are a part of paying the bribery or giving the bribery or uh, offering something like that. So again, it is an uh, internal process and uh, you have to be, uh, uh, I mean, every organization, uh, they must have internal uh, investigation handling or procedures or grievances procedures to take on that. And uh, even ISO 37000 is, uh, is very focused on not only how to handle the in, uh, incidents, but at the same time to create the awareness and to to provide a level of communication between everybody working in the organization and your third parties. In case if there is heavy, there is any kinds of uh, allegations, so where you need to go, you don't need to call the police. Mm -hmm. First, you need to follow the internal procedures. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, follow the procedures. Um, I, I like the, the one that you said just now uh, regarding the uh, checking whether the, we have the substance before we start the investigation. Does anonymous le uh, complaint counts because it doesn't really have a solid uh, foundation to, to be based on? What do you think? Yeah, it means uh, whistleblowing is always a kind of to telling you something mm. to to I mean whistle is mean you are whistling. It's, it's not necessary that you some you, we can expect that somebody will send you a bundle of documents. Yeah, but it's a kind of uh, alert, alert that this is happening within your organization. So. You, you need to follow the procedures. For example, what level of internal control is weak? So obviously there will be a, a story uh, in the complaint mm. that some of your employees is involved paying bribery or mm. somebody paid or offer something on your organization behalf. Mm -hmm. mm. So every crime have a beneficial owners. So there must be some beneficiary. So we need to go with that according to the internal procedures because uh, um, we don't recommend means uh, uh, going to regulators at first instance is not a recommending process. Mm. And reporting every incident to regulators is risky mm. because uh, you need to complete your investigative process, the in-house investigative process. Yeah. And maybe it's a baseless complaint. And uh, when you will be speaking with regulators and you don't have initial process, the due process within the organization. Mm. So there will be a wasting of time uh, of uh, other uh, agencies involved with that. Mm. Yeah. So meaning to say that uh, management, top management should never turn a blind eye if they see there's a complaint of any any anonymous letter because there must be something behind that, right? Yeah. We, the, the, for example, mm -hmm. this is one of the part of uh, ISO 37000. Yes. That what is your investigative process? Mm -hmm. So organization need to demonstrate their procedure and policies. Mm -hmm. that if they received a complaint, what they will do? They mm -hmm. will just turn, turn down that or there is some level of process. Yeah. So they need to dig down and they need to find out what is the information involved and what is the level of allegation or evidence. Mm -hmm. So 
Every organization, they have some kinds of investigative process. And uh, that can be a compliance team, that can be a compliance officer, uh, integrity officers, mm-hmm. or uh, some legal department, or even HR department. Yeah. So those professionals need to analyze the uh, level of uh, allegation. Yeah. And then, then they find means, uh, you know, I mean, every investigative process provide the findings and loopholes or internal controls issues. Are, those are areas is always um, good to understand, to even, not only to improve the internal controls, but also to give a, a zero tolerance policy to your stakeholders yeah. that we, we, we have a zero tolerance against the bribery if that is being our uh, or somebody is offering. Mm. But the, the point is that they need to understand that what they are doing is to protect the company, protect the business owner, so they, they, the business owner and or the managing director doesn't go to jail because they see this is just a small matter. At the end of the day, it can be a monster behind the inside the cupboard, right? Yeah. Mm. As we, uh, we, we discussed earlier that corruption is organized financial crime. Yeah. It's not incidentally happened. Mm. So it's a, it's a plan that, for example, if if uh, if I'm looking to get some business and I uh, I'm planning to pay against that. Yeah. So it's a, it's a planned process. Mm. So uh, it's not just to protecting uh, things, but the level of transparency. Yeah. Yeah. Me, you need to demonstrate the transparency, not protecting things. Yeah. yeah. So. Maybe you are protecting the wrong people, oh, yeah. but when you are speaking on the transparency, you are protecting the whole process and yeah. your brand entirely. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. So, right. Yeah, so protecting the branded reputation is important than protecting an individual. So that's where the process or internal control should be very transparent. When you are receiving, I mean, organization should have a hotline. They must have an independent process of uh, receiving complaints. And at the same time, there will be in conflict-free process of investigations. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for painting the big picture. Now I understand. Yeah. We have a question here from Tom Kane. You know, uh, yeah. there's a question. No doubt global corporation will have to deal with compliance and regulation requirement in each country they operate. Mm-hmm. How should a uh, internal corruption case that crosses con- country boundaries be handled and more importantly be reported to the various regulators and would there be a situation where one takes precedence over the other? Yeah. We, um, we have a local uh, regulatory frameworks and then we have global international regulatory frameworks. So obviously in certain countries we don't have a model le- legislation like the UK Bribery Act. But FCPA UK Bribery Act are the legislation across the world. It's not a jurisdiction specific or country specific. So uh, <clears throat> it's again mean a global organization. They have a global regulatory framework. So they implemented those uh, regulatory framework across their operational jurisdictions, not just the one specific uh, country. And uh, some countries, uh, some companies, they have their regional specific regulatory framework. So it, it all depends on the organizational structure. So obviously a, a local company, they don't need to go with the, a global structure. It's a, it's a costly process and uh, maybe it's not their requirement. But few things are very important. For example, the due diligence. Yeah. The due diligence is a global process, disregarding you where you are located, the size of the business, or the industry sector. So the due diligence is a minimum level of investment if if organizations have these kinds of process. Mm-hmm. So that is a uh, you can say it's a it's a it's a first step to manage the risk to working with a questionable business partners. So this is a very good practice uh, if organization can adopt just single due diligence process or third party risk management. So that's a global process and uh, that can ensure uh, their 
smooth working and transparent working across the world. We'll take a second question from the audience. It's mm -hmm. from Mr. Deepak Singh saying that having whistleblowing policies is about whistleblowing policies in the place is rather straightforward. But any tips on how can we communicate this, especially to employees on the ground who does not use emails? Yeah. Uh, I mean, different organizations have different processes. Some organization, they have hotlines. Uh, some, they just use a complaint box within the organization for uh, offices. But you don't need to send the email. You can just write something and drop in the complaint box. Mm -hmm. And that complaint box is not accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. And the other is, uh, I mean, it's hard to believe that somebody don't have um, a, 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 a communication equipment like the web, <laughs> like the phone. Yeah. Yeah, in, in yeah, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right, yeah. It's uh, almost uh, very impossible nowadays, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, so there's no excuse. Live, we can't live without food, maybe, but not without the cell phone. Uh, yes, yes, of so if, if you have a cell phone, you can use that medium. But we have this practice, for example, uh, uh, some organization, they used uh, uh, complaint boxes within organization and you can write down and put in uh, if you don't want to write even so there are other whistleblowing uh, hotlines uh, you don't need to tell your name but just need to send the information and we have those case studies even uh, other than to the ABMS um, one of our clients it's a, it's the largest pharmaceutical company and the situation was there uh, some of their um, employees involved in a parallel sale mm -hmm. and fake invoicing mm -hmm. oh. and and the whole process was involved from the chief comp uh, chief uh, financial officer cfo to the sales representative so everybody was involved with that oh, wow, wow. and one of the employee was been there was no process of formal process of sending email or those kinds of things but one of their um, team uh, member, he decided to inform in other uh, side of the business. I mean, this uh, he sent information directly to the corporate security people based in USA. Mm. So he just tell them that this is going uh, going on from last more than four years, and every year there is a financial audit. There is everything in place, but nobody is telling the truth that how the things are going on. So it's a completely fake invoices. They they involved uh, selling physician samples, expired medicines, and at the same time they are using lots of illegal activities. And companies, uh, I mean, auditors are coming every year for a financial audit, and they are spending time and just going back all is okay oh but God. there was all is bad not all is okay but uh, again back to the question i mean is you no need of sending just email there was certain other areas that's where i mean uh, one of the process in iso 37000 to establish the communications yeah. a transparent communication policy and procedure if there is any allegation or there is anything somebody need to speak so is there must be it must not be a barrier of sending uh, its uh, information to a specific channel if they, don't, they do not know how to communicate then they need training the state probably need to be trained exactly on, uh, I mean, yeah. training awareness that's that's where uh, the training part is very critical mean Obviously, we, we cannot uh, expect that each and every level of employees are, uh, have the same level of uh, understanding. Yes. But you know, means if you are telling a labor person working in the field that we have a zero tolerance against the bribery or the corruption, mm -hmm. so at least some introductory level of training must be there for the field workers. So if you find some information or some wrongdoing, somebody is asking you or someone use 
you can uh, you can see it's uh, paying something uh, illegally so you need to speak up so introductory training awareness that should be a part of uh, that that is essential requirement for iso 37000 agree 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 now I'm going to ask you something regarding the uh, ISO 37001 ABMS, which is I think very important. Is regarding the ethical dilemma nowadays. In business gift, is it bribe giving or is the bribery? You know, because uh, every face is that we're going to have uh, Adafit very soon, uh, High Raya Adafit tree very soon, and then the company. Some expected to receive pour, pouring the, the gifts, the hampers, the vouchers are coming in, some to the office, some to directly to the home. Okay, mm -hmm. and then some come uh, organization or company, they think this is all right. But we do know that sometimes even the the present uh, is small, but it's very expensive. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very good question, sir. The, the thing is, uh, um, if I'm not used to have a dinner in Seven Star Hotel, mm. uh, I'm used to have a, my homemade food or maximum I'm going with a four star or two star hotel. Okay. So if you find me having a dinner in a seven star, why me? It's a, it's a big question. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing is, there, there is a certain level of policy. Be, uh, one week before, uh, in Vatican City, uh, Pope uh, take this initiative for, for his uh, institution, that there will be no gift more than a 30 euro, I think so, 30 or 40 euro. Mm. So he, he fixed the uh, amount. Mm. There will be no gift more than value of 30 or 40 euro, I think so. So, I mean, obviously the value of a dollar or euro is not small, even if this is a one, do one euro or one dollar, but uh, there must be obvious reason to paying a gift, a high level of gift. I mean, you, it's not a normal thing. And secondly, if there is a conflict of interest or you have a business um, associations, mm. then it's more co more complicated that wh why you are paying a un uh, unreasonable gift or un un I mean unnecessary gifts. Mm. So gift entertainment, this is one of essential policy and procedure for each and every organization. And that's what ISO 37000 regularized those things mm. that you cannot pay a certain level of gifts are give, um, involved the gift or entertainment. For example, paying a gift or giving a gift to a government officials is always questionable. Mm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's very clear. There is no rocket science. I mean, it's very it's a common sense that if I give you example, if I'm not used to, if I'm a government officer and I'm not able to eat a food in a two star hotel. Mm. And now I'm going in a seven star hotel. There must be something wrong in the bottom. Yeah, must be, must be it's something <laughs> right there, <laughs> something not right there. But some, some company this is OK until the authority showed up at the office, then they start to worry. Oh, is something strong? Yeah, yeah. We, we, this is where we check when we conduct audits. So we check the procedures. Mm. The thing is, if okay, if you are giving a gift of a Mercedes car to somebody, what is the level of approval? So mm. is there transparency? Yeah. Uh, what is the level of approval? Means who approved that? Mm. That that should not be hidden, mm. or that should not be uh, under the table deal. So, OK, if you are giving and there is a, a, a clear policy that this is a uh, maybe it's employee um, recognition. So this is this may be a kinds of other things, but the policy and procedures are always based on the transparency. It's, it's not based on the table dealings. So what is the level of uh, entertainment or gift schemes? Mm -hmm. There must be a policy and procedure. And a, a chain of uh, approval process that who is the person approving that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. So it's a, it's a control process, internal control process that somebody is 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 monitoring the risk. Yeah, yeah. This exactly. Is mean some if somebody means obviously the the person approving that give he or she will ultimately the responsible means there is a accountability process. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I was sharing with uh, Robert just now uh, regarding uh, one issue. Uh, it's about uh, COVID-19 because it's mm. going to be a dramatic uh, effect on the uh, white collar practices. Okay, mm. people are working at home. Uh, bosses cannot monitor from in office, and yeah. then there are there are people, employee, and then vendors. They are behind the back. They are using uh, the new norm technology. For example, the electronic gift card. So I purchase the gift card, and mm -hmm. then I send you the code, and you can use the code, and then you can shop online. So nobody mm -hmm. know that who's using the code. This is mm -hmm. anonymous. But do you think that ISO uh, three seven double zero one ABMS can stop all these kind of uh, new things the emerging? Things that can, you know, uh, yeah. The, I mean, um, to be very honest, n no system or legislation can stop anything. Yeah, it's always a control, and you can reduce the processes, uh, reduce the practices. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no guarantee that if somebody is uh, certified, and there is a, no guarantee that they will not be involved in 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 the kinds of. Uh, or a certification is a guarantee that there will be no bribery. The thing is, it, it's a process. Mm. So if you follow the process and you have control, I mean, you know, in the business, business is, is not just trust. Business is control. True. I mean, if you don't have controls and you are just have trust, then obviously the things will not be working as by your expectations. Mm. We, it's not only the bribery, Working from home is a, all is a very risky process. It's a cyber crime. It's a loss of information security risk, and there is other uh, areas. I mean, even work. I mean, home is not a workplace. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, again, the thing is, there is a, a solid process of everything. Yeah. So even if somebody is purchasing are involved in the purchasing what is the process the follow to follow the process if uh, you are following the process then you have a level of controls in place so obviously the iso 37000 when they have this situation um, they launched this uh, standard there was no covid 19 mm. but the thing is the controls will be um, developed or improved with the new requirements. So organizations are working for their controls of how to work on, how to regulate our business processes during the work from home. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, means you cannot stop, but you should have effective controls. Agree, agree. At least you have some kind of measure, control measure to yeah. stop it. Uh, last question for you, sir. Um, uh, in Malaysia, there's this uh, perception regarding ISO 37001, mm. ABMS, saying that it's just a product, it's just a tool. Meaning, mm. mean to say that it's just a nice to have. Can you please explain furthermore why this is important for coming to have this ISO implemented in their organization?
That, that, that school of thought, like a paper-based compliance system and effectual implementation. So obviously, if an organization's motive is not to implement effectively, and it's just a check in the box, so there will be no effectiveness of this system. Okay, you will have the certificate hanging on the wall. Yes. But it makes no sense if there is no effective implementation. That's where I mean our approach is totally different. I mean, ABAC auditors, they um, collect evidence. It's, they, they're not just checking the paper-based policies. So we collect the evidence. So if you implemented something, what is the evidence? So the sampling is the process to making sure that there is effective implementation. So if you are not providing sufficient evidence, that means that area is a gray area and that is not effective. So ISO 37000 is a game changer. It's not just a tool. It's an effective risk management process. But again, it depends how serious an organization is and there is a, there is a lots of benefit. Uh, now we have uh, ISO 37301, the compliance management system. We have uh, current clients or lots of new clients. They are uh, in, uh, they are making mean you no know, an integrated management system to with the both uh, integrated uh, standard. So they they wanted to demonstrate a comprehensive compliance management system, not just the anti bribery. So um, again, back to the. Um, Effectiveness is a, it's a wrong thought that that's just a tool. It's an effective uh, management system, but again, it's depend if you are effectively implementing or if that is just a check in the box. Yeah, yeah. It depends on both sides. Justification yeah. is one side that the company need to be serious about it. Yeah. Very serious. I mean, that's why it's a tone from the top. Yeah. So you have to be serious if you are in, because I can understand, I mean, it's not easy for those organizations if there is a significant uh, practice of uh, mm, uh, depending on um, different source of um, undocumented business or if the organization believed on uh, no transparency or if their business is questionable. This standard is not for them. Okay, I just get, all right. Thank you for that. Okay. We are, we are heading to the end of the session. Any last word from you to our audience all over the world? On this? You know the, the, the response and the um, significance of uh, use or um, effective use of this standard is in Malaysia, which is incredible, really. I mean, uh, throughout the world, uh, uh, how MSCC responded to this, or other regulators, or business community, local business community, uh, we are working with largest organization in Malaysia. They are very serious and they like this standard because there was no one system or one standard to fix this problem. Yes. And uh, maybe there is a web of different legislations, enforcement actions or laws, but this is one of the international best practice this regarding the industry sector, this regarding the size of the business, this is ISO 37000 is one of the best uniform practices and uh, we are very positive with this, that uh, uh, this can not only increase the brand reputation of an organization, but it's uh, overall increase the revenue or sales or uh, business point of view, it's, it's very helpful for the business community. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Zafa. We hope you stay safe, stay healthy. And thank you. Happy thank you. Ramadan. Happy Mubarak. Happy Fitri, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. Thank you so much. We hope to see you again. Okay. Thank you so much.